Father, we thank you for this uh, blessing to share your word today in Yeshua's name. Amen. Some of us just got back from Armenia, Ariel and I and, and Lauren and a few others. And uh, there was a lot of things that happened there, but uh, particularly we had a revelation of just the importance about not only the country of Armenia, but of Mount Ararat and what happened there. It was pretty uh, huge. Before I want to start, I just want to say thank you to all of the dear saints that were there in Armenia that received us and to all of our friends at the Global Family from Watchmen, my friend David Demian, and uh, just a lot of people participated in that. So, praise God. Well, when we got there, in, you know, Armenia is a country that's situated right next to Mount Ararat. Mount Ararat actually is on the border between Turkey and, and uh, Armenia, actually a little bit on the Turkish side, but it really stands on Armenia. So you feel that it's part of Armenia more. And uh, it's a huge mountain. It's really enormous, and it's, and it's not in the middle of a big range. It got, just kind of stands there, so it, it dominates the skyline. And the impression of it just like reminds you of what happened there. It's kind of a little bit like when people come to Jerusalem and all of a sudden say, oh, there's the Temple Mount, there's the Mount of Olives, and, there's the, and it just makes everything come real to you. Well, we had an experience there, at least for me, of just the whole importance, the hugeness of what happened uh, at Mount Ararat, and then, of course, in all the, the history uh, coming after that. Well, let's just uh, start with, uh, let's read one verse in Sefer Breshit Per Ket, Genesis uh, 9, first verse says, et noach ved banav milu et And God blessed Noah and his sons and said to him, Be fruitful and multiply, and fill the earth. That was the message to uh, Noah and his sons as they left the ark and went down into the land. The Armenians believe that they came down off of Mount Ararat toward the east side, which is where Armenia is, and they claim that they were the first to receive Noah and his sons when they came out of the ark. But I think that what I think that was I think that was uh, I think that was a little bit of folklore. But anyway. Um, so here we have this command of God uh, b blessing them to go out to the nations. Now, a little bit of my own processing this, I want to say that 45 years ago, when some of us, uh, the fathers of the Messianic Jewish movement, when we came to faith and we're trying to understand the scriptures, one of the things that we understood was that the scripture had to make sense from beginning to end. You couldn't sort of pull it out and say, well, this doesn't, the New Testament doesn't belong to the Torah. I mean, because we're Jews, it doesn't. That we 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 began to understand that the whole Bible had to be true from beginning to end. You with me? The next thing we uh, that I saw anyway was that uh, the beginning of the Bible starts with the Garden of Eden, and ends up with the Garden of Eden restored. It's sort of like Paradise Lost and Paradise Restored. Is this so? It, it's obvious that the whole Bible is a continuing story that makes sense. Now, after that, uh, as we began to share, we, we really wanted to connect the, the, the whole gospel with the New Testament, the New Covenant, with the covenant of, of Abraham. In other words, it doesn't start in Matthew. We've got to go back to the book of Genesis, and we, we really saw it starting in, in, uh, in Genesis 12. And uh, in Genesis 12, when God says, I will bless those who bless you and, bless you and curse those who curse you. And that's kind of how I started. I mean, I remember the first message I ever preached 45 years ago. You know, it was on that. We did that, and then we would take up an offering, you know. <laughs> God help us. But then, but then I realized that it was really wasn't talking about that. It was the second half of the verse that somehow we missed. It said, through you, all the nations of the earth will be blessed. And all the families of the earth will be blessed. And I realized the idea of you, I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you was a secondary corollary from the main point of the verse, which is that through you, the nations of the world will be blessed. Oh, we begin to change how we looked at things. You know, this, the Bible isn't about telling us how we're going to get blessed. No, the Bible is about God's uh, mandate to see all the people in the world blessed. 
and began to see that. Later on, another 10 years after that, maybe about 30 years ago, I began to say, wait a minute, the covenant of Noah, co the covenant of Abraham comes after the covenant of Noah. Now that may sound obvious to you, but 30 years ago, I was like, I was like this was like somebody turned on a light in a room. I'm going to say, no, no, the covenant of, of, of Abraham, it follows. The covenant of Noah is already there of God's telling them to fill the earth. And then Abraham comes then to facilitate, to make the covenant before him come to pass. In other words, God told him, we'll get into this in a minute, but God told Noah to be fruitful and multiply. And now God goes on and makes it more specific with Abraham. Now I want you to go back to Israel. I want you to set up the covenant there. And he, he moves it forward. But he was moving forward a plan that was already there in, in Noah's time. So the Abrahamic covenant came to fulfill and facilitate what was already in the Noah's covenant. Isn't that clear? Wasn't clear for us as Messianic Jews. I have a lot of Messianic Jews still probably wouldn't agree with me with that. But anyway, so I understood that. I had that theology correct. But then I got to Armenia. I, this mountain is like enormous. And all of a sudden I thought, Wait a minute, the understanding I had was the right understanding, but it was like this big. And it's not this big, it's an enormous mountain of understanding. And of course, anyone who knows the Bible, you pick it up right away that the, that, that language of be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth is what is, is a second loop of, of Genesis, of God's commandment to, to Adam and Eve. He told them to go and be, be fruitful and fill the earth, but he also told them to take dominion. You don't see that quite there. It's almost as if they missed, we fell at the time of Adam. We lost our authority. We're, we sort of come a little bit the way back, and God says, okay, now we're going to start over. You're really not ready to take authority yet. At least just fill the earth. We'll work on the authority in another thousand years. It'll, it'll come up with it. But, uh, but you see how God's uh, working this plan. Now, I think about that, you know, Noah is such, I just got a little message from Superbook. They have a new a Noah's Ark a version coming out with the, the, you know, the kids coming out and, the, and, the, and the, the little animals coming out. Listen, this story is horrendous, horrendous. I cannot imagine the pain in God's heart. I can't, I, I can't, I can't even try to think of it. As if I think, I feel like I'll faint. If you try to imagine the pain in God's heart, where he says, every human being that I created, how many people were there? A billion people? I don't know. A hundred million? A million? Every single human being I've created hates me. I'm your father. And his heart was broken. He said, I'm just going to have to wipe everybody out. And the only one he could find is Noah, who was sort of righteous. The rabbis say he was righteous in his generation, meaning he was only, you know, compared to everybody else around him, he was righteous. But, uh, you know, he had a drinking problem. But anyway... He, he comes, and, and I think about the pain in God's heart. And then he says he's got to wipe out the whole earth, and he chooses to do that by water. You know, and we think that, that it, it's possible that was the first time that rain ever fell on the earth. That, and he wiped out everything that was on the earth. Is it to wash it all away, cleanse it all away? Of course, in the New Covenant, we say that's the, uh, the Bible says that's a parallel, a parable, of what happens with us in our own life individually when we pass the water of being immersed in water, that it, our, our life, our past life of sin is washed away like the waters of Noah, and we come out fresh out of that. I also think that's true of the nation of Israel passing through the Red Sea. It's, there's a passing through water to wipe away the bad past and come into your, in the new promises uh, of God that is for us. So God chose to do that, and then... He looks and he's got this, this one family. And apparently, I mean, there's no reason not to think it. It makes, it makes pretty good sense that it was there on Mount Ararat. Uh, some people say that the word Ararat is, is like from that word Arur, cursed, and that's the place that the curse was broken. Uh, Mount Ararat. I, I, don't, I don't know enough of the linguistic background on that to know if it's true. But God did wipe away the curse. He starts with this new family and renews his plan that he had with Adam and Eve. Let's stop there and let's look at that. What's the plan? It's obvious, both with Noah and with Adam and Eve. 
He's, he makes a beautiful world, a garden, and he tells them to be fruitful and multiply. So if you be fruitful and multiply, what's going to happen to the garden? It's going to get bigger. If it says fill the earth, what's going to happen? I mean, what, what, what is God's obvious plan? You're going to have an entire planet that's like the Garden of Eden with people living all over the planet that love God. That's God's plan. It hasn't changed. A beautiful world with beautiful people, a global family living in a global Garden of Eden. That's what God wants. He hasn't changed it for a moment. You know? And, and so God says, well, that's, I'm going to start renewing this plan. Now, he speaks to, to, um, to Noah and his sons. And I realize now what faith, what grace, in the midst of God's pain that this has happened, he looks over these people and he says, I haven't given up on you. You know, I'm going to keep loving you. I'm going to keep working my plan with you. Even if it's only one person out of a, out of a billion people, I'm just going to keep believing, believing in you. And you go up and, and keep going. So he says, I'm going to keep loving you until this thing comes to pass. I can't imagine how much faith God has in that group of people. I mean, you know me, I know you, you know what we're like. How did God have any faith in us? He said, well, I had to wipe everybody out, but I still believe in you. So they go out, and of course he's got three sons, and I look at that, that there was three reactions there. You know, when, he, when Noah sinned, one was righteous, actively righteous, one was passively righteous, and one was actively sinful. I think that represents what happens in the, in, in, for every human being. There's basically those three choices to react to God's plan. You're either actively righteous or you're passively righteous or you're actively evil, you know? And, and so, and everybody that gets multiplied, I mean, think of it. Uh, Shem's sons could have been what, one, <laughs> one actively righteous, one passively, or one evil. And Ham's son, and, and, uh, uh, Ham's son could have been the same way. So it multiplies out. Maybe that says something future about how God looks at the human race. He starts, it's interesting, I don't know how this fits in, but of course the, the righteous son there is called Shem, uh, and uh, it's funny that that name also means name. And it's funny that in Hebrew today, we call God Hashem, the name Shem. Anyway, I don't know what that has to do with anything, but I thought it was interesting. But um, So they come out, and they begin to fill the earth. Now, it's interesting, when you get to that area of Armenia, it's, it's, it's an interesting location. Armenia sits, of course, there's real close to, there is, is Georgia and Azerbaijan, but it sits right in the center of three huge empires. I mean, so you can drive, the, drive across the border into Russia in the north, Turkey on the, in the west, and Iran to the southeast. You can actually drive in. We met some people from Iran that have come in. It's amazing. Uh, Sweet believers from Iran, amazing that, that, that this is happening. Um, so I think about that location. God chose that. You know, he sees the beginning, he sees the end from the beginning, and he chose that location for his, to declare his plan and this giant plan that he's got a plan for the entire human race, that God's going to bless all the families of the earth, and he sets it there right in the middle of Armenia, but also from our, in that place from Ararat, flowing out into Turkey, into Russia, and into Iran. You, you just see the hand of God on this is, is enormous. Now, one of the things about the, uh, about the Armenians is that uh, they were the first nation who, who, as their government and as a nation, they declared themselves as a Christian nation. Now, of course, obviously, the first revival that happened and the first people group that received the issue was here in Israel. But our nation did not receive it officially as a government. And then, of course, we were exiled and we went out and then the gospel starts to go out and there's revival in many places. But the first place where the revival touches the whole nation and the nation actually declares itself was in the year 300. The nation declared itself to be a Christian nation is, okay, Armenia, but let's look at it a different way, at the foothills of Mount Ararat. How did that happen? Well, I guess that was just a coincidence. Uh, I don't know. Is it possible that God brought the gospel back to this place to have the first Christian nation being in, in, in the shadows of, of while well, the people there are looking at, at, at the Mount Ararat? It's so imposing in, in their capital city, Yerevan, where we were just at, and 
And, one, and the, the church that we were in, the central church that we were at anyway, it had a symbol in front of it where you have the, the Mount Ararat, a cross, and the Bible. Really, I mean, that's, that was, that was the, the, what the Christians were thinking in, in Armenia all these years. Fantastic thing. And we look at God's plan to go forward, and there's kind of a parallel between, if you look up at Mount Ararat, of course, it's snow-covered. I think it's always snow-covered in the top. I don't think there's ever not snow. I'm sure a lot of people have gone up there trying to dig under the snow and try to figure out if the ark is still there. But, but um, the Bible speaks of another place in the Middle East that has snow on it. Obviously, where? Kermon. So there's kind of a parallel between Mount Ararat and, and Hermon, Mount Ararat for all the nations, and Hermon for, for this area, Israel and Lebanon and the Middle East. Of course, Mount Arafat is much bigger. But uh, it's interesting, it says that the blessings come down. And there's a flow of blessing. It's a spiritual blessing that comes from heaven. But it's like rain coming down, forming snow on the top of a mountain, and then flowing down in the rivers into the nation. Another metaphor is it's like the, the oil on Aaron's head flowing down the beer. And, then, and another thing it talks about, that that flows then into Mount Zion, that it comes in. It's just beautiful to see this, this idea of God's letting the blessings flow from heaven into the nations. All right. Now, the next thing that we saw in, in Armenia was that they suffered a lot for having been Christians. Let's jump all the way up in history. They have a long history there. But one of the big events that they had was in the year 1916. 1916 was a, a, a horrible event for them called the, uh, the Armenian Genocide. Um, in Hebrew, uh, genocide or Holocaust, it's kind of the same word. We actually went with them to their Holocaust Museum. They have a Holocaust Museum in Yerevan, very similar to the Holocaust Museum here in Jerusalem. Of course, two different Holocausts. Now, to put a little perspective in that, most people don't know that the history of the Middle East is dominated by a certain country. Do you know what country that is? Turkey. Turkey ruled the Middle East for four Hundred years exactly. They conquered the Middle East in the year 1517, and they were conquered by the British in 1917. 400 years, Turkey reigned over this entire Middle East, and it was the, the uh, Osmani Empire, and it was the Muslim Empire. So the Muslims ruled. Now, within the Muslim Empire, there was a group that began to get more jihadist, more extremist. Now, of course, we're looking back 100 years, it's hard to know exactly what happened there, but from what, from what I can check in history, and then that group of jihadists in Turkey decided to kill the people in Armenia. One of the big revelations I got by being there was this was not a war between Turkey and Armenia. That's not what it was. This was a jihadist attack against Christians, period. It was Muslim extremists coming to kill Christians. They had nothing to do, it was not a political thing. Was, I'm sure there was some, you know, political elements. But it's just like Al-Qaeda, it's just like ISIS, it's just like Hezbollah, it's just like Hamas. It was a jihadist group that came in to kill Christians, period. And when we went into the Holocaust Museum and you saw pictures of them just doing things that were beyond evil, you know, just slicing up women and children in front of their family. It was just so much like Hamas. It's a type of evil that you just get there. And I think about the years 1916. Think about this. This is before the Nazi Holocaust. We were always of the thought that the Nazis gave the idea of killing the Jews to the jihadists. And I realized that, no, 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 that's the opposite. Where did Hitler even get his idea? That he got it from the jihadists. In fact, Hitler has a famous quote where he said, oh, yeah, well, we can kill the Jews. Nobody will mind. Look what the jihadists did to the Armenians, and nobody says anything, so nobody's going to say anything when we kill the Jews either. Because Jews and Christians, that's what, the, that's, what the devil is trying to, that's what the devil is trying to kill. Now, I think what happened is they got at this. Now, this is my interpretation of it. But when that happened, I believe there was a sentence, a judgment in heaven to bring the Ottoman Empire to an end. It's amazing that the Ottoman Empire collapsed 12 months after that, after that war. 
Is that just a coincidence? 400 years? They come to the, the height of their evil. The Bible speaks of a nation coming, their, their sin being come to their fullness, and then judgment comes. God doesn't judge. He waits until it comes to a fullness, and then he judges it. And so, and then I believe that's what happened. They came there, he judged it, and God blessed at that time anyway the, 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 the British Empire to come across and, and conquer it. And at that time, they also conquered all the rest of the Middle East. They conquered the Turkish Empire, which had also been a colonial power over Israel. And then it became a British co colony. The idea of saying that Jews, this is, we are making a colony of this is absurd. This has been a colony of, of Rome and of, and, and, of, uh, uh, and of the Muslim world and of the Turkish world and then the British. It's the, minute, the Jews are the people, are the original people coming home to this place. We're the only ones that aren't colonials. Everything else is colonials. But that's another story. I don't want to go in that direction. Um, so Britain conquered this in, in, in uh, the world in 1917 and that drop the the uh, the uh, Ottoman Empire, but the people in Armenia suffered with. They are wounded today from that event, very much so. As the Jewish people, we carry the Nazi Holocaust in us. It's just something you can't forget. It's there. It's part of your identity, and they carry that. It's you know for us Jews, we we have to you know get this. Hey, can you understand that? Anybody else? They carry their subconscious identity is is formed to a solid extent, well, part of it, by this jihadist slaughter that they went through in 1916. Now, what happened, unfortunately, a few, when it came to a vote in the, in the UN, it was about four years ago, I think, about for the, for the world, for the UN to recognize the, 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 uh, the genocide in Turkey. And Israel abstained. We abstained for just stupid geopolitical reasons having to do with China, with Turkey primarily, and, and was just everybody here, 99.999% .99 of our people totally believe it, totally support it, totally, we just, we just decided to abstain in that. But they don't know that. All they knew is that we let them down. And there's anger in there, anger in the Christians in Armenia, not let, not, uh, let alone the non-Christians in Armenia, toward Israel, that we didn't even stand with them. How could you not, after having gone through the Holocaust, how could you not stand with us in our, our, our Holocaust? So that was one of the things that we had to do as a delegation from Israel in front of all the, the bishops there in, in, uh, in, in Armenia is just get and say, look, we made a mistake. We ask you to forgive us. And when we started that way, but people just, everybody began to cry. It was amazing. We just opened up a, a touch. And then we went to the Holocaust a museum, and then we flipped it toward the positive and said, wait a minute, both of our nations, Armenia and Israel, and actually every individual Christian in the world who really follows the Lord, the Bible says every, every person that wants to follow the Lord and righteousness will be persecuted, we have a shared experience, which is that we share the, the, the koinonia, we, we have the, the mystery of the fellowships of the sufferings of, of Messiah, that we we share in Yeshua's suffering. We have that as a nation in Israel. We have that, they have that as a nation in Armenia. And every individual believer that walks with Yeshua, we have a shared experience. It's a beautiful thing. There is such a, a depth of intimacy when you realize you have an experience of sharing suffering together with Yeshua and those others who have suffered for the sake of Yeshua. Now, the idea, I don't want to go in this direction either, but just to mention it, the idea is that, that God doesn't want believers to suffer, that we're just going to live a comfortable life and kind of, you know, it's just not true. You know, anybody that walks in righteousness, you're going to be attacked by the world. The world is evil. You walk in righteousness, you're going to get attacked by it. Of course, everyone who is an Arab and lives in a Muslim country and stands up for their faith, they're going to get attacked. Uh, not just Arab, but, you know, I mean, Turkey's not Arabic and, 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 and Iran is not Arabic. They're Persian and Turkish. They're, but, but any nation in any situation, obvious in, 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 in China, any place that you're at that you stand for your faith, you're going to get persecuted. And today it could be what's happening in the West right now. God forbid you believe that there's such a thing as a man and a woman. You're going to get persecuted. 
How dare you be so binary? You know, I mean, it's like you're going to, and, and anyone who walks in righteousness is going to get persecuted. But we all have a shared experience. And as we knelt down in front of the flame in the middle of the, the Holocaust Museum, and we took hands together as international Christians, as Armenian Christians, as Messianic Jews from Israel, and we realized we had this joint experience of shared suffering for righteousness sake, oh, it was a very, it was a very deep thing that happened. Now, as we come up, then there was another big offense, was that, you know, uh, Armenia has been on, in a war with Azerbaijan, and because of Azerbaijan has stood somewhat against the border in, in Iran from, from moving forward, we decided in Israel to sell weapons to Azerbaijan to, be able to protect the border with Iran so that Iran wouldn't come forward. And what happened with the war with Azerbaijan, they took Israeli weapons and pointed them at the Armenians and began to slaughter the Armenians again. I met, I can think of three specific times, and, and that just people that I met, the kid were worshiping together, and we come in and says, oh yeah, well, uh, in this recent war, my son was killed, or my husband was killed. And the next line is, by an Israeli weapon. Well, how do you respond to that, you know? I'm sorry? You know, that's what we said. And But again, we didn't do it, do, it, do it superficially from some depth of our heart, and it was such a beauty of people embracing one another and weeping and repenting and reconciling. It was, it was so awesome to come to that point and to think of it doing in the shadow of Mount Ararat and, and, and having all these pieces come together. It was just a, a beautiful experience of the Lord doing something powerful in our midst because spiritual warfare is partly in prayer but it's also partly in repentance and it's partly also in reconciliation it's also of course in righteous deeds and in, in, in sharing the gospel it's in many many different things but there was a breakthrough in spiritual warfare as we all held one another and wept and, and included some people from iran who ex-muslims from iran that had come to be with i mean it was just well, you, I, it was just shaking to see that happen. It was very deep. You were there on the last day. It was, it's hard to explain how intimate, how powerful this was. One of the things that was also interesting, when you think about spiritual warfare, is that, as we said, part of spiritual warfare is prayer, but also it is reconciliation, repentance, unity, fellowship. As we build the body in love, it releases God's power in spiritual warfare. Now, listen. I can't say that if this was connected or not. Maybe it's just an experience. But as an Ari and I were flying in to Armenia, we were in the same airspace at the same time. I mean, right there, our plane is coming in and Raisi's helicopter went down. It was right there. I mean, I don't know if it was an hour away, a, a six hours away, but it was, it was basically the same, the same day in the same airspace. I mean, it was, we didn't, I'm, I'll put it this way. We didn't hear it before we, took off and we heard it when we landed. I mean, it was, it was that close. And you just say, wow. Uh, by the way, I talked to one woman, a, a Christian woman from Iran. I said, I wasn't sure, you know, it's, it still it was present. I said, well, I just wanted to ask, you know, what did you think of the, uh, you know, the death of the, the president of, of Iran? She went, yeah. <laughs> like that, with the, I said, "Okay, we're uh, we're on the same page." But and she showed me a picture. It was very interesting, of of women's braids, hair braids, coming up from the ground, and taking hold of a helicopter. Wow! Now I just want to say, listen, we're not talking about something a political opinion this way or there. It 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 very may well be that in the last five years, this man has killed, murdered more human beings than any other human being on the planet. So I personally believe, and again, this is your discernment, you can disagree with me, I believe that God t had a, a death sentence on this man. And, and I also, I also think this as we come, again, this is not the topic, but just a slight deviation. I think that's what happened with Hamas. Hamas was, was, was preparing 18 years to attack us. They crossed the line, slaughtered women. They didn't rape women, they mutilated women. 
wasn't even rape. It was too much, even it was too ugly even to call it rape. But it was, it, it, and, and I think that God passed a death sentence on them. And I believe, now I don't know, I can't say that that's true for Hezbollah right now. I mean, because God waits until their sin is fulfilled. But Hamas's sin was fulfilled that day. And I believe that God passed a death sentence on it. And it seems to me that he's told our soldiers to go in and, and kill them. You know, they have a death sentence. Now, you might disagree with that, but that's how I see it. I don't want to go in that direction. But again, I just want to say one more thing. We love the people of Gaza. And if you love the people of Gaza, you want Hamas out of there. Because if Hamas stays in there, their lives are going to be ruined forever. And they will be damned to hell forever because Hamas will never let the gospel be preached in that country. If we really love them, and I don't think we do that much, we ought to just come in Israel and totally take it over and just run it and open a place. That we won't. It'll be some sort of coalition of other nations, so it'll be a half thing. But anyway, anyway, let's come back. So, so we're looking at this, this, this covenant of, of Ararat, and um, one day one of the, 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 the bishops that we were working with here looked at him and said, uh, he said, you know, really, we would really like to have a covenant with you. You know, and he was talking, I mean, right when we were standing right in front of him. So he went with Israel and with the body of Christ in general. I said, covenant, what? <laughs> you know, you're, like, you're speaking our language, pal. You know, and you want to have a covenant. Now, we didn't, we didn't suggest that. But all of a sudden, I began to see this historical lineup of the covenant of Noah with the covenant of Abraham with the new covenant. And it was so powerful to think this. Now, of course, uh, of course, you can say, well, there was a covenant with Adam first, and then under a Abraham, there's also Moses and David and so on. But, but I'm just trying to simplify it so we can see it. Think of these three big covenants, Noah, Abraham, new covenant. And you think about these, th this plan being lined up in the spirit, being lined up in our thoughts, being lined up in our sense of mission, if I can say that word, you know, connecting it with, with the with the great commission of the Lord and just seeing God's plan to bless all the nations of the word coming from Ararat through, and then in that area, I mean, more or less, that's where Abraham lived. He got made a couple with God. God sent him into back into the Holy Land toward the area of the, the Garden of Eden. He said, now you start my next stage of the covenant here. And when that's ready, then Yeshua will come here in this place to bring the new covenant. Lining up the Noah, Abrahamic, Yeshua covenant, lining up God's plan for the nations, families with the nation of Israel, with the gospel message, lining up this with Mount Ararat, with Mount, I don't know if you want to say it, Mount Zion or Mount Moriah coming in. And then, I mean, it's just all of a sudden, are you feeling with me? All of a sudden, it's like everything that all seems so clear. So logical, so linear, so like it's just like wow, this is the same plan. Nothing has changed at all. And when you get things lined up, you know, if things aren't lined up, like in a gun, if you don't have things lined up, you can't shoot. And it was all of a sudden when we stood in that way and said, "Yes, we make a covenant together." The 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 people of Armenia, the international family, by and the and the community of faith in Israel it was like click click click. You know, like always saying alignment. They were all wearing T-shirts that they had this alignment logo on it and, and was like, well, it was just lining up the plan of God. And it was like we could feel this sort of, I felt anyway like a rocket in the spirit just whew, was all lined up so nothing was preventing it, just the power of God going forward. And I want to tell you folks, this could have never happened before. Could never have happened before. You didn't have a community of faith in, Ar uh, in Armenia having gone through their suffering with a new community of faith restored, the Messianic remnant in Israel, coming with global and, and the nation and Arab believers, lots of Arab believers that were there with us, coming in and standing together, internationals, Arabs, Jews, lined up in the covenant. This could have never happened. Folks, the kingdom of God is going forward. Sure, there's a lot of opposition. Sure, there's a lot of warfare. Sure, there's a lot of suffering. But great things are happening. Now, it's amazing to think, one last thought, is that 
there was such a connection with Armenia. I mean, you think about that. A quarter of the old city in Jerusalem is Armenian. How did that happen? Hello? A quarter of the city of Ar in, in downtown Jerusalem is Armenian. Hello? Armenia was the first Christian in. Hello? The Mount Ararat. Hello? The plan of Noah. The plan All that is one quarter of, the, of downtown Jerusalem? It's just click, 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 click. God is just lining things up in the right way to be able to uh, move his plan forward. So uh, those are some of the things that happened this week when we were there. I just want to pray for this alignment of the covenant, which advances the kingdom of God. Okay, that's the type of thing that makes me excited. But uh, so, Lord, we just pray right now, Lord, for the alignment of the covenants, Lord, from Mount Ararat to Mount Zion, Lord, from Mount Ararat to Mount Moriah and, and, and the Mount of Olives, Lord, just coming in into, to, from Ararat to Hermon, coming in, lining up your covenants, Lord, lining up your mountains, lining up your people, Lord. And we thank you for what happened there of bringing repentance, forgiveness, reconciliation, a feeling of a family. That's what God said to Moses, to, to Noah, make a family. And, and we have a global family coming in to love them and to love one another and in, in international and Jew and Arab and, and even Armenians coming together to submit themselves and line ourselves up with the covenants of God, with the plan of God and the purposes of God. You know, I feel like the Holy Spirit is saying, look, it's not just the fact that it's a covenant. The covenant is a contract to move forward the plan of God. So you're not just getting lined up positionally. You're getting, we're getting lined up to see the purposes in the covenants come to pass. That's what's exciting. It's the gospel message. It's the nation of Israel, and it is a global family coming to pass. We're lining those, the purposes of God lining up together. And we thank you, Lord. We all just come and submit and say, God, now this is your plan. And we thank you that over that plan appeared a great rainbow. Lord, these are your two affirmations. The hugeness of this mountain and the hugeness of this beautiful rainbow to say, God saying this, my plan of paradise restored, of a global family and a global garden of Eden, of a beautiful world with beautiful people, has never changed and it's going forward. And you can get on the boat, or you can get off the boat. You can be like Shem, or you can be like Yafet, or you can be like uh, Haman, but you can, but it's all there, and it's going forward. And we thank you, Father, that we see the light and the rainbow and the kingdom and the family and the covenants lining up together. Hallelujah. Thank you, God, for your blessings on us in Yeshua's name. Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. Questions, comments, criticisms. I just want to say, Armani is is an Italian um, designer. This is not. This is Armenia, which is a Christian nation in the in the in Central Asia. Just that. Okay, I'm sorry. I'm. I know. I'm just sorry. I'm just busting on you. There's the traditional Armenian church, and that's why there's an Armenian quarter here because they. How are a little different than either the Greek Orthodox or the Catholics, or the other major Christian, you know, expressions, uh, traditional Orthodox expressions. So that that's their identity as a people. It comes from the Church. Then you have um, there have been missionaries of all different sorts and kinds in uh, Ar Armenia. The, the The genocide happened primarily in what today is the eastern half of Turkey, which is called Anatolia, which is, there was just a huge number of Armenian people there, um, as well as Greeks and uh, Assyrian Christians. That's the other, the other sort of proofs that um, this genocide was a jihad, was, was primarily, I mean, it had, as Asher mentioned, it had ethnic and political dimensions to it as well, um, but the proof that it was a you know, without Islam and without jihad, it wouldn't have happened, is that it was directed not just against the Armenians, they were the primary group, but it was also against the Assyrian Christians and the Greek Christians. 
And it happened in waves, uh, the major part being in 1915 and 16, but it's actually started 30 years, be- 20 years before. And it was really, I, I, I did, was reading some books and things on it and then going to the museum. It was like October 7th for 30 years off and on, if you can imagine that. And just in rural settings, um, I, I, I kind of, when Asher said it was like a, a group of radical jihadists took over in a way that is kind of maybe happening in, or happens in certain Arab countries, but actually it really, it was across the board. It was Kurds, it was Turks, it was all of the different Muslim tribes uh, who were just unleashed to to slaughter and do October 7th uh, uh, for a long time. In, in three major waves. So anyway, and, and by the way, the, how it connects to the question about, about uh, revival in Christianity, every, the Turks have, have just totally uh, erased anything in their archives and can, you know, that would support. And there was a lot of governmental things that happened to make it happen. But the, um, the thousands of testimony, there were thousands of Protestant missionaries, mostly, from America, England, uh, France, um, the, all the European countries who had been ministering in this huge area for generations. And they were there during these 30 years, during the most of these events. Uh, and so their, and their testimony, you know, and some of them were, they loved Turkey. I mean, they loved the Ottoman. You know, it wasn't like they had a bone to pick. Uh, so that sort of proves the, the fact that this was a, uh, it wasn't primarily an ethnic, it was a religious, had a huge, 90% of it was religious. Um, and in terms of revival, there have been revivals, and, and we, you know, we were connecting there, and the group that welcomed us is really from the sort of Pentecostal, uh, not surprisingly, uh, w- wing of, of, of the Protestant Christians there, and there's a strong element and the, among the, uh, there's a huge, uh, another thing that's parallel with the Jewish people is there's this huge Armenian diaspora um, from that time. I mean, Armenians are everywhere in the world. Uh, and the churches, there's a lot of very strong churches in it. So I don't know about exact timing of revivals and things, but there's a lot of very healthy church and things, activity all across the board you now in Armenia. I would say, just add a couple of things. Of course, we saw groups of strong believers, the people that were willing to meet with us. It was interesting that the, the culture of Armenia is very conservative. And people were conservatively dressed, and the, the pastors came up with a suit, not with tie, but, you know, a suit and shirt. And, and uh, they're very kind of, and they have a mentality of remembering that we, we are a nation that suffers for our faith, but we don't give up our faith. That's there like all the time. You feel it with them. That's part of their uh, identity. Yeah. When we heard testimonies from some of the senior leaders who were in their 70s or 80s, their testimony, you know, this uh, Armenia was part of the Soviet Union, okay, since, you know, and uh, so they, their testimonies were just the testimonies of what they went through as young Christian leaders uh, from the KGB and, you know, all those kinds of things. Uh, what they suffered, <laughs> and I'm just without bite our Bibles and the person that was appointed by the Russian communist government to destroy the believers in Armenia was a Jew, not just our, in Armenia, a Jewish communist. Yeah. But anyway, so it's, Nitkin was his name, but uh, it was also I just want to say this other thing is that I showed this in a previous time, but the thing that really shocked me there's a really famous picture of when the jihadists came in. Uh, in, into Armenia, and they they took the Christian girls and said, "You you you know, if you repent, if you give up your faith, we'll let you go. If you don't, we're going to crucify you naked." And they said no, and you see this row of them hanging on the cross, naked. Pierce, it's just I mean, you just is it, you can see that 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 just the devil, you know, it's like it's hates Jews and Christians. Because, and what my viewpoint is, is, is the devil really hates Jesus. That's who he hates. And he's trying to hurt Jesus. And the way you hurt Jesus, it's hurting his spiritual family and his physical family. So the devil is out to kill Jews and kill Christians. 
and tortured him to hurt Jesus' feelings. That's how I interpret it anyway. But what Asher mentioned too that that the other kind of proof that this was a jihad, uh, primarily a jihad, was that those uh, who converted to Islam were saved. That was the condition all over the place for thirty years, uh, not just for the girls. You know, if you submit and convert to Islam, then you're welcome. Uh, so. And we, we pray, and we'll, we can finish with a prayer all for the nation of Armenia. Uh, right now is going through a very testing time, as is the its neighbor just to the north, Georgia. These two little countries who are both Christian, uh, very you know, in their history and their tradition and their culture, sit in the middle, as Asher mentioned, of Russia. Russia is right above, right, Turkey. And Iran, uh, and then you know over there is the is Europe, way over there, and um, the ones you know for the Armenians during this time, if there was anybody, anyone from, they were crying out to the West, and the missionaries there were crying out for help, uh, and the only one who really uh, did anything was Russia, from the Christian West. That that was their say. Now it's with Ukraine and this, it's very complicated. Uh, they would like to be more European and uh, it's a very difficult time. So Father, we pray and we just bless the, the nation uh, uh, and bless the government and pray for your wisdom. Lord, and pray for uh, your will to be done in, in these countries, Lord God, that there would be what, good, whatever's good for the gospel. Lord, you said for, to pray for the leaders and authorities that people might lead a peaceful life Lord, so that uh, m- many can come to the knowledge of the truth. Let it be there. We bless them, our brothers and sisters, everyone we met and all the fellowship we had. In Yeshua's name, amen.